you've worked in a leadership position in both the public sector uh, with the Correspondent School and now you're a senior partner in PwC. Talk about leadership in both of those organisations. What has it meant to you? I'll talk about the Correspondent School first. Um, so I um, went to the Correspondent School when it was um, in a fairly terrible in a fairly terrible state. So, a bit of background, this is the country's largest school. Um, at the time that I was leading it, 25,000 customers, students. And while the public image of the Correspondent School is very much that this is children in lighthouses in remote rural areas, in fact the reality was quite different. These were students who were our most at risk, so perpetual truants, um, children in prison, uh, and so on. Uh, people for whom really the, the formal schooling system had failed and this was the last stop for them in education. Um, so 25,000 of those, uh, around 300 of that 25,000 were, um, were genuinely remote rural students as per the stereotype. The rest yeah. were at risk really. The staff, um, average age was 68, average length of tenure was 18 years, almost 100% unionised, uh, more than 90% female. Um, and really struggled um, with the needs of these high risk, very high needs learners um, and how to really adapt curriculum to meet their somewhat unusual needs or unsupported learning environments. Um, the place was in a financial deficit of a very severe kind and I was very much in there as, uh, as an intervention by the Ministry of Education to, to turn it around financially. Mm. Um, the, a troubling thing happened the day before I started the job as CEO. On the Sunday night, the previous CEO phoned me up and he said, oh, Debs, there's something I probably should tell you. He had fired a, a, a teacher a month or so before for an inappropriate relationship with a student, which was pretty awful. But in the course of this, he had investigated that teacher's computer. And this had uncovered a challenging material of a largely pornographic nature on 250 of the school's computers. So in my mind I was going in to lead a change in a service delivery model mm -hmm. to reorient us towards better service for at-risk kids. Yeah. But in actual fact my reality day to day when I went in from day one, morning one, was I had a pornography crisis, a media firestorm, and, and the crisis did involve members of my immediate SLT. Whoa. So a horrible way to start that role because I spent my first four months in disciplinary hearings and mm. I had to do it, there was no one else who could do it, me and my board chair. Mm. Um, and, and it was against the context of a lot of difficult media scrutiny and it was really no way to begin the relationship with my staff. When we emerged from, from that awful period, um, it was hard to rebuild trust mm. um, with the staff. I was seen, a, I don't know, perhaps a an avenging angel or a, or a <laughs> and because you couldn't tell people what it was about, maybe I looked terribly Methodist or something, <laughs> I don't know, but it was, it was really hard to be the real me mm. with, and you could see people doubting and being sceptical. Mm. Um, and then our mission was terribly important because these were the neediest kids in the country and they needed us to do things better for them. Um, but we also had a financial hole mm. that was, in many respects, every bit as compelling. So while we worked extensively with our good staff and our stakeholders and our parents to redesign the service model, mm. looking back on it, I think one of the things I made a mistake about is I drove change too much from, from the financial position. Teachers, good teachers, they don't get out of bed in the morning yeah. to save money yeah. or to fill in the financial gap. They, they get out of bed to change lives and, and give kids a better future. And I didn't perhaps paint that light on the hill of that better future compellingly enough. Create the compelling vision, yeah. really, or, or, or purpose. Or yeah. when I tried to do it, perhaps there was a slight scepticism gap that was yeah. bigger than normal yeah. because yeah. of the um, pornography shenanigans. Yeah. So it was a really challenging time. Over three years, we completely redesigned the service model. We renegotiated the funding model with the Ministry of Education. We really did start to get better outcomes. and. Our engagement did improve, mm. but I learned a lot from that about it's all about trust and showing your heart and being real. Mm. 
And my nadir, my worst moment as a leader came during that three years, that three or four years, and that was when there was a, a North and South article on me, which um, talked about the journey the school had been through, and it was fairly scathing of me personally. Yeah. And I walked into an airport and I saw my husband's ex-wife reading this North and South with me on the cover. <laughs> it, was just, it was just the worst moment and it was really, really upsetting. Mm. And it was hard not to take that personally and just keep moving on. Mm. And, and to just show the staff that, because it was so public, so all the staff were reading it. Mm. Mm. And, and they, they didn't know what to say to me. Mm. And you had to sort of let them know that yes, it hurt, mm. but that you still were going to carry on. Yeah. And, um, and that was a hard, kind of balance to strike, yeah. you know, what was being professional and what was being real. Yeah. So that was my kind of um, most challenging, I think, time leading. Now in my private sector environment at PwC, um, in a non-corporate world of a partnership, it's all about developing your people. It's the only asset we have. So it, it really, in some ways, it takes me back to my roots as a teacher. It's about constantly talking with my people about how we together can do things differently, how we can develop you in this and build on your strengths in that. And um, we take it really seriously. We act where people are struggling um, to support them, put them somewhere else, exit them if that's needed. Because at the end of the day, all we have with our market is our client relationships. Yeah. And if the relationships are not right in-house, at home, amongst our people, mm -hmm. then they're not right with the clients. And so one of the things we try and do is, in our performance management, we, we reflect that by um, saying to our guys, look, you can bring in all the money in the world, but if your relationship feedback from clients is bad, yeah. or if your upward feedback from your own staff is poor, that won't count, yeah. Yeah. because it starts at home. So I'm not sure we always get it right, but we're certainly really focused on it. Yeah. It's a, an embedded and normal part of things, and when I come to the PIF, I don't, I don't see that more normalised, mm. very accepted ongoing performance management so yeah. evidently. Yeah.